anyway, I got a call into Buckingham Palace to present my portfolio and just have a little chinwag, which I did. And I got suited and booted and went down my portfolio. <laughs> and we just chatted about my work and a couple of pictures that they had liked, one of them being Daniel Craig. And I shot the uh, the Queen and Philip's uh, 70th wedding anniversary picture, official portrait. And then I, I, the next commission for them was, or from Kensington, was with for Prince Louis' um, christening official portrait, which was, uh, you know, Kate and um, William and Harry and Meghan and, uh, and Charles and Camilla. If you lead an interesting life, good pictures will happen. Oh, nice. You might well be my sexiest sounding guest. Go somewhere you've never been before and take a camera. We had this gorgeous Mediterranean light just flowing in. Which as do we win? A Dartford. Very nice. Your first 10,000 pictures are your worst. Let's sit down. Let's have a cup of tea. Welcome to the show. Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to this week's episode of the Standout Photography Show with me, Matthew Walker, where as always it is my honour and privilege to sit down with the finest working photographers in the world to unpack their systems, workflows and find out what enables them to perform consistently at the very top of their profession. On the show this week, I welcome portrait photographer Matt Holyoke. That is at Matt Holyoke on Instagram and MattHolyoke.com on the World Wide Webs. That is Holyoke, H-O-L-Y-O-A-K. Matt is one of our most influential photographers renowned throughout the world for his captivating portraiture. His work has featured in Vanity Fair, Harper's Bazaar, Interview, The Times, Vogue, Rolling Stone and GQ amongst others. A career-defining moment for Matt was being commissioned by Buckingham Palace to photograph the official portrait of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and His Royal Highness Prince Philip, Duke of Cambridge, in celebration of their 70th wedding anniversary. The success of these portraits led to a further commission, this time by Kensington Palace, to photograph the official portraits for Prince Louis of Cambridge's christening. Matt also dedicates his time to charity work and has worked on campaigns including Cancer Research, Children in Need, Haiti, RNLI and White Ribbon. The success of his most recent campaign for MQ, a mental health research charity, awarded him the honour of ambassadorship in recognition of his commitment to help eradicate mental illness in young people. As the official photographer for BAFTA Film Awards, Matt marks his achievements of the most revered actors and filmmakers of our era through a series of portraits published in GQ magazine. When I first started the Standout Photography Show, Matt was one of the first names I wrote down as someone I had to get on the show, and I am incredibly grateful to him for giving up his time to speak with me. During our conversation, we discussed honest portrait photography, lessons from assisting, learning the business of photography, running your own studio, learning from your mistakes, harnessing pressure, truly understanding and visualising a brief, very important, in order to push creative boundaries, stepping away from the edit to find clarity, photographing the royals, and of course, cutting up shipping containers. Without further ado, please step away from the world and enjoy my conversation with this man, Mr. Matt Holyoke. Let's be awfully official. I will say, Matt Holyoke, welcome to the Stand Up Photography Show. Well, um, thank you very much. It's Uh, a pleasure. uh, No, the pleasure is honestly all mine. And I feel like I'm saying this to everyone I speak to at the moment. I said it to Julia Fullerton-Batten, I said it to Tom Stoddart, but I think this is the conversation... I've been most looking forward to having so (laughs) you like many people I speak to are in that wonderful position where other people describe you and your work so as an example camera press bio describe you as one of the world's leading celebrity portrait photographers but how do you describe yourself and your work as a photographer uh I, I mean I I just describe myself as a portrait photographer and it's it's really basic i mean uh, essentially you know a, a photographer but my speciality is portraiture yeah so i just describe myself as a portrait photographer why photography 
and I know that is extremely broad. Um, I, I kind of fell into it, really. I originally, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a painter. I wanted to paint portraits, so I started in in you know college when I was doing art. A lot of my my work was 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 painting and fine art, and then you know I I just got really interested in people's faces for some reason. So I started painting portraits, and and really that's that's what I wanted to do. And what I did is I took pictures from pictures that I would paint to or paint from um and it was a mate of mine who was uh we used to skate together and he used to assist a guy called Steve Gullick who's a music photographer uh and to be honest I just I was working on a building site then I was a roofer so I, I he got paid being an assistant so I just thought a I could learn some new skills taking pictures to paint from and b I could actually not work on a building site and work here you know and get paid uh helping somebody take pictures and and then i just got the bug from there you know and uh, it, from from that it it was never my passion really it was always something that i just used it as a vehicle to to paint to paint from so but but once i got into it and i started learning about it and i started understanding the craft of photography i i i you know, I got the bug from there, and then it then it became a passion, and then obviously became a job. How many years did you spend assisting? It's funny actually, because uh, when I was uh, when I was sixteen, I, I left school at sixteen, and I went to work for uh, an architect called Norman Foster, and I worked with him as uh, a trainee model maker. Then I went. And I, I was always painting at these times, trying to trying to kind of develop my skills there and and try and get some exhibitions off the ground and stuff like that. And then I then I went into roofing, uh, which was because I didn't like model making, <laughs> so I went into roofing um, through a friend of a friend of a friend. Uh, and then I got a job for a yeah I, I I put the feelers out when um you know when when Jamie was uh, was working with this music guy. So I put the feelers out and I started working in still life uh, with a, and I, I actually forget the guy's name um, who I work for. He's, he's quite well known, but he, I worked for him for a bit and I, and I, and I absolutely hated it. I hated the way that he, you know, that just, just his working mentality, all this kind of stuff. So I left him and I went back into roofing and I actually became a chippy for a while, not thinking I'll get into photography again. Then went back into roofing and I was sat on a roof in Gatwick and it was chucking it down with rain and I was like, I want a job that flies me around the world. So I, I decided to go back into that. So I'd say really this is when I started to really get into, um, you know, working out that I wanted that as my job, which is probably 23. And then I left, yeah, t late 22, early 23. And then, and then left the system when I was 28. So... Not not that long, like six years. I mean, you say it's not that long, but in six years you can learn an awful lot about your craft. What are some of the best lessons that you took from your time as an assistant? Ah, oh, do you know what? Different people gave me different skills, I suppose, and I learned so many different things. So I was I was I used to I was first assistant for ranking for pretty much the majority of my assisting days. So for him, I suppose I, I kind of I, I took the business side of it and understanding how to get work as a photographer and be in that working environment, which I think is invaluable in 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 photography. Because so, uh, a lot of people think you know that that photography is about just taking pictures, and I think you know a lot of the time is about finding finding the work, trying to get the work, you know, producing the work, you know, the actual kind of photographic side of it it's probably like for me like you know 30 20 30 percent the rest of it is is the business side of it but so so yeah i mean i took from assisting i took you know kind of that side of things the business side of photography um i learned a lot about but you know there's other guys i worked with like anton Cobain, who's who's a music photographer and i worked with him for a, for a year or so 
with him i just took and and this is where i fell in love with portraiture is i took that rawness of photography and you know it wasn't massive lighting setups it wasn't overly technical it was just pure portraiture and that's where i kind of fell in love with portraiture so you know there's there's so many different things that you can t- i mean the one thing that i would say as an assistant it's it's i i think it's really different if you're a freelance assistant out there to actually being a full-time assistant now freelance assistants which i did early days is you don't get the same kind of um skill set or or learning from from freelance assistant i don't think because you're you, you're literally just going on set and you're working with the photographers on set and you, you kind of leave at the end of the day and that's your job done and that works very well for some people but for me i needed to or, or i wanted to you know i wasn't i'm not very academic and I'm, I'm i'm i struggle with dyslexia so i kind of you know the business side of it and the kind of that side of of that work i needed to understand it and and i was never going to do that as a freelance assistant so i chose to be a full-time assistant and i think that's where you you learn a lot more and you learn the behind the scenes and it's and and not just the photographic element of it of what it's like to be a photographer I'm pleased you mentioned the business side of it because it's been one of the consistent themes when I've been speaking to high performing photographers because you're right if you can't sell your product then yeah. it's just for you really and there's nothing wrong yeah. with that but I guess that's what separates someone who wants a career as a photographer yeah. versus someone that wants to do it as a hobby when you well actually firstly let's look at when did you know the time was right for you to step away from assisting to go in and creating your own path? To be honest, there, when I left assisting, I there were certain situations where I was competing with somebody else within the job type of the job that I was in, and I actually don't think it was the right time at the time. I didn't think it was the right time for me to do what I did, which is leaving assisting, and I think. Uh, you know i kind of just pushed myself out there i don't think there is ever a right time it's it's one of those really you know there's no recipe behind it well so if you know you go assistant then you do this and then you do that then that will happen everybody's got their own journey so i, I couldn't say well like for me i i kind of i don't i, I felt at the time wasn't the right time but i forced myself out because of a certain situation i was in at the time and i didn't want to i didn't want to go and assist another photographer i just thought you know i'm young enough now that if i if it doesn't work <laughs> if it doesn't work <laughs> out i can actually go back into another job you know so i i i honestly couldn't say with my hand on my heart are this the you know if if this kind of thing happens then this is the right time to leave and become an assistant because everybody's different and i think for me like i said i I just forced myself out into the world because of a certain situation i was in i wasn't happy about so again it was just kind of by chance that i took the leap it wasn't planned i was planning to keep on assisting for another three four years at least with the person i was working with so yeah, it. I was. I was forced into a certain situation, uh, and then I took it upon myself to go. Look, you know, I might as well start it now rather than leave it a few more years. And uh, it, and and now, if I can start it now and, and it doesn't work out, then yeah, I can. Uh, I can look at going back to roofing, or I don't know, doing something different. Do you think, ironically, that perhaps being forced into that situation helped you? Because, as you say, you could have yeah. spent another two or three years assisting, whereas actually that situation, and many people could have just walked away and gone back to the easy option, and you didn't. Yeah. So having made that decision, or in this case potentially being slightly forced into that situation, what practical steps did you take in order to start on your own career? Well, I, I mean, I've always been one of those people which well, that's really good at, you know, that the going out and getting work i've never been scared of work and and so I, i've i've kind of got that in built me and that's why i've I, I done so many different jobs before i got into photography so for you know so it it, it kind of was one of those things where i i looked at it and i was ready for the challenge i thought that was that was basically one of the biggest things is that you know not that 
not whether it's the right timing it's whether you feel inside yeah i can do this and i and i just had it inside me that yeah okay you know i i can actually go and get some work so i just went i just picked up the phone and started calling people i'd done a few small editorial shoots i mean obviously all my personal work so i just took it but i I just literally just picked up the phone and started calling everybody i knew and you know again i I think you know there's there's certain things right time right place but i had i through i knew a few people at vanity fair and through um you know assisting days met a few people so actually my my first job as a as a portrait photographer was uh, was commissioned by vanity fair about six months into uh, to 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 leaving assisting and going on my own i'm pleased you mentioned vanity fair because it's one of the jobs that i wanted to come on to discuss so we'll come on to that a bit later but first i wanted sure. to talk about your studio because you're one of the few photographers that i've spoken with that has and runs their own studio in london so would you mind yeah. describing i guess firstly why you chose to get your own studio versus hiring studios as and when they were required yeah i um I always had this vision when I was when I was younger, uh, and like I said, when I was getting into photography, that that's what a photographer did. They, a photographer, had their own studio, and that's where they work. And so I always had it in my in my mind that I'd always have my own studio, and so that was that's why you know it, it was really it was more of a kind of vision and a, and a and a what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> you know, it was something that I that I kind of. And I didn't really think about it. It was always for me. I wanted to be a photographer, so a photographer has his own studio, and that's what you do. So that's what I did, basically. <laughs> for anyone that has not worked in your studio or not seen your studio, would you mind yeah. describing some of the elements that are in your studio that allow you to create the quality and style of images that you've become recognised for? Sure. Sure. I mean, to be honest, I don't really shoot much in my studio. <laughs> I am at the moment, but where the last couple of years I've been travelling a lot, so I've been working in different countries. So, but I always think that having a base and somewhere that you can, you know, a lot of photographers who don't have that. Obviously, everybody shoots differently, but I love a space that I can have my kit out. I can test things. I can lay stuff out, and and for me, that's kind of invaluable in in what i do in the way that i work but um yeah the studio space so i originally it was a meat factory and what's what's lovely about my studio and why i love it so much is that it was just it was one big open space that um i could do whatever i wanted in there and you don't get the, those spaces very often in london anymore more often than not they're cut up into little boxes or or they're way out of town you know and, and i'm in haggerston so i just kind of got by chance again being in the right t- place and right time just got gifted this uh, this place that was just a big open blank canvas so i took in so it's just one big open box and i cut up a, uh, a shipping container and put that into the space and then built a mezzanine floor around it and the uh, the shipping container was originally an office and, and then upstairs was was another kind of smaller office um uh, since then now it's changed now it's the hair and makeup room and then we've got a little kitchen out off the side but it's just you know it's got it's really quirky you know because of that and people love, love coming into those kind of spaces because they don't feel generic and it feels like you know it feels homely uh but it's but it's a nice open space you know so um so yeah, it's uh, I, I love it, and I and I think that the beauty of it is is because I was able to, and the landlord was really good to me, so I, I was able to do whatever I wanted with it. <laughs> there's a couple of fun clearing it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a couple of things you mentioned there, and I I have to journey back on both of them. Firstly, you said so casually that you cut up a shipping container. Yeah. I, how <laughs> did you? <laughs> Uh, firstly how did you get the idea for the shipping container and then how did you go about cutting it up (laughs) (laughs) it's funny well to be honest i looked into building the structure 
Peter in there and I had watched George, I think it's George Clark's Amazing Spaces and uh, one of these guys had made this this house out of shipping containers and basically when you should buy a shipping container, uh, the structure and everything comes with it. So it kind of measured up to fit in. So basically, it was just cheaper for me to do that. That's why I, that's why I did it. And I'd seen it on Amazing Spaces. And, and, and I'd run this. I, I'd just done a bit of Google search and looked around. And there was a, a shipping yard that did secondhand containers that they would cut and deliver into to anywhere in London. I mean, we had to forklift it down the road. My studio's on a tiny little cobbled street, and we had to forklift it down the road. Lucky I've got a big open shutter and straight into the into the property. But, yeah, I, yeah it was George Clark's amazing spaces, basically. But it was just a cheaper option for me. But, I, I, yeah, really, I mean, what, I, because I, the structural work that I looked at, I was just, I wasn't willing to pay. So, I'd, and I'd seen this, so I looked into it, and then I was like, yeah, you know, the character. I, I, and I, I, I love it in there. I wouldn't have done it any other way now. One of the wonderful things about doing these interviews is the things that, you just least expect and the last thing i expected was you to say you'd cut up a shipping container for your <laughs> studio absolutely brilliant i love it the, the other thing you mentioned which i think was interesting you said about being able to because you also, have your sorry Go also it acts as a uh, a really good safe when i'm not in the studio because <laughs> we put all the kit in there and just lock it up is that oh it? of it's course really so, so it doubles up i mean technically you are kind of the visionary for box park Really? Well, you know, I was you know? going to say that, but <laughs> 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 to, be, to be honest, actually, I my old studio, I had a studio in uh, Chance Street, just off Redchurch Street in uh, in Shoreditch, which I had, uh, originally uh, I rented an office in that space, and then the um, the guy who owned the studio wanted to leave, so I inherited the studio and ran it as a business there which was right opposite Box Park. And I don't know why, maybe it's actually looking over at Box Park that I got the idea. In my head, I've got it from George Clark, but I don't know. <laughs> so what, was, so what was that show? George Clark, Amazing Spaces? I think it's Amazing Spaces, yeah. I'm going to have to yeah. check that out and I'll put it in the show notes in case anyone else he's wants genius, to as well. He's genius. I mean, uh, to be honest, you know, like I was saying about originally back in the day, I, was really, I, I loved architecture and i love buildings and i remember when i was a kid i, I drew an interior of uh, me and my wife are actually looking at um, a new place to buy at the moment that we can uh, either a bit of land that we can build and i've just got this drawing that i drew as a kid of an interior of a building i've always loved it i've loved buildings i've loved structure so you know george clark stuff I, i'm fascinated by all of that and i love building stuff and making stuff you know I'll put it in the show notes so anyone can check it out and I am absolutely going to be watching that this evening. <laughs> the other thing you mentioned and it's something that Adam Hills talked in length about because he also has his own studio. You mentioned that about testing your photography. Do you think having your own studio has made your work as a photographer better because you can try things and you can test things that you potentially couldn't do in a higher space? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, um, for me, I think, again, going back to how who I am and, and how I learn and the way that I suppose my mind works, which is not overly, you know, I'm not an academic, as things don't come to me very quickly and I, I don't, I, I'm not like one of those people. I mean, I work very quickly once I'm on set and, and that's kind of part of, of what I do as a photographer to make it quite easy for everybody. But I think the, the, um, the learning and the craft, and I, I, I always seem to come to a job and look at it as if I'm looking at something for the very first time. And I think a lot of people come into work and go, all right, cool, I've, I've done that, and I've done that before, so I'll do that here. So for me, I always kind of look at something, and, and I never... I never really go, oh, okay, this situation, right, okay, the, well, that's going to happen, this is going to happen. I always come to something like I've never seen it before. So having a space that I can I can test stuff out and I can go, right, okay, this is going to be this environment, this is how I'm going to do this, or what am I going to do different on this one, it, it allows me that time to kind of, in my head, get to a point that I, I understand it. So when I'm going into the shoot, I can really – work with uh, with my talent really you mentioned earlier vanity fair 
And it's something that I wanted to come on to because you've worked and your work is featured with Vanity Fair, with Harper's Bazaar, The Times, Vogue, Rolling Stones, GQ, you name it. The list just goes on. You're also the official photographer for BAFTA Film Awards and you've worked with the Royal Family, which we will absolutely come on to discuss. But did you have a goal and a vision for how your career would look when you started out? Because I know you mentioned earlier that you had kind of a an idea in your head that you wanted a studio did you have yeah. a vision for how your career would look as well it's a good question i think i mean if i go back to when i was really young no because i i mean i you know really when i was at school i didn't even know you could be a photographer and i think that was the thing that that really you know, when, when I say to you, a mate of mine was assisting a music photographer, da, 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 that was the first real time that I really knew that, you know, photography a, was a job and you could do it as a job. But it's, it, it, no, I don't think I did. I, I didn't have a, a long-term vision. I just knew that when I, when I started taking pictures, I really enjoyed it. And I definitely, I went through different, areas of photography to get to where i wanted to but to where i've got to now so i worked with some still life guys i worked with a car photographer i worked with some food guys um and then and then i went into fashion and then really kind of towards the end of that assisting days portraiture became you know really what i wanted to do and become my passion and and really that's when i got the vision it wasn't when i was younger the vision when uh, you know, and I say that, you know, we're going back to when I said I didn't know, you know, not I don't know what the right time is to leave the system. But I definitely had a clear vision then that I knew that I wanted to be a portrait photographer. And in that world, I wanted to work with high end talent and and kind of get to an area that was high profile, I suppose, you know. So, but, you yeah, it's sorry, go on. No, no, no. It's just interesting then that you said, whilst you didn't have a clear vision as such, you knew you wanted to work with high profile clients, yeah. which I guess in itself is is a subconscious goal, at yeah. least. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think, you know, saying high profile sounds a little bit you know a, a little bit conceited i suppose but you know what i mean by that I, I think i knew i wanted to work with actors or musicians that were well known but uh but again you know it, yeah there still wasn't a clear vision i think you know there's it's I, I i'm one of those people that kind of builds blocks as you go along and you know you get to a certain point and go right okay though i think you know that's that's where i'm going to go next or that's what i'm going to try next so although although yeah no i definitely knew that i wanted to be a portrait photographer and i, and I had that vision that i would have my own studio and that i wanted to work with actors and musicians i'm still building blocks you know i'm still getting i'm still wanting i, I i'm not um I'm still learning. I'm still working out. Uh, you know, I'm still kind of working out where my voice is and and uh, where my next journey is, I suppose. It's so refreshing to hear you say that you're still learning and you're still building blocks because there will be many people, including myself, that admire your career. And it's so refreshing to hear you say that you are still learning and developing your craft and developing your style. Yeah. Let's... Let's come on, because we've, we've discussed uh, actors and people that work in entertainment. One thing I have to discuss with you is the royals. I've spoken to a lot of photographers who are privileged to work in very unique environments, but none as unique as your relationship with the royals. So for anyone that is unfamiliar with your work with the royal family, would you mind describing what you've done for them? Well, I I shot the uh, the Queen and Philip's uh, 70th wedding anniversary picture, official portrait, which was which is you know an amazing commission. But also there was a couple of different things that came about. They were the at, at that time they became the longest living royal married couple. Uh, and yeah, so I so I shot that image, and then I, I the next commission for them was, or from Kensington was with for Prince Louis' um, christening official portrait, 
which was the uh which was uh you know kate and um william and harry and megan and uh and charles and camilla it's an incredible commission it's i mean it's yeah. it's a mind-blowing career-changing commission can you work out if you if you look at the the steps to get there can you work out how that inquiry came about yeah yeah it's i was a wild card so i uh, you know i I, i'm trying to think of uh the names but anyway uh, yeah i was a wild card going in situation so the you know buckingham palace were looking for somebody to commission uh to take this picture and actually camera press were uh look after the the royal imagery and so they'd the buckingham palace had asked camera press to to present x amount of photographers to go into the mix one of them being myself um i know that annie Leibovitz had written to the queen personally i believe and there was a few other people who had done that because it was a really special commission so anyway i got a call into buckingham palace to present my portfolio and just have a little chinwag uh, which I did, and I got suited and booted. Went down my portfolio, <laughs> sat in this room, and you go. And I went into this room, and and Angela, there's a couple of people, Susan, and then Angela, who's the Queen's dresser, were there, and and we just chatted about my work and a couple of pictures that they had liked. One of them being Daniel Craig, and I think another one randomly was Gemma Chan, and she, uh, Susan, was like, you know, we really love these pictures, you know, and 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 the informality of them and the honesty with them and. And then they started asking me questions about, so if you were in this certain situation, what would you do and what would you, you know, how would you approach this shoot and what would you like to get, to, to get from it? And so so from then they just said, uh, so we, we kind of went through some different, you know, it literally was just a chinwag. Anyway, I left the room and then I got an email saying, you know, we'd like you to present a document uh, of, of really of how you would, you would approach the shoot which I did and I remember I was uh, I, I spent all night right I spent a couple of nights writing this document I think it was like 18 pages long and and my wife <laughs> looked at this like oh my god you know they're, they're not going to get this they don't, they don't understand like I, even I don't understand what you're going to do 18 different ideas so I just stripped it right back to two different ideas and one of them that I, I really wanted to get back to was the honesty of portraiture and and forgetting all of the you know the royal accessories and all these bits and I, and I just wanted to take a picture of people two people who are in their 70th anniversary year um, who are who are in love and so my my picture was just strength and honor and and a really honest picture of two people in love and I, and I think that went down well because obviously I got the gig from that. It's an incredible story. It really is just an incredible story. And to hear the journey of how you got that job. You mentioned then that they asked you how you would go about your work. And it's something that I wanted to touch on with you as well. On a shoot that is that important and on that scale, what yeah. will you delegate as a photographer to your assistants? And what will you not delegate? And not because of trust, but what elements do you personally like to control on a shoot like that? I don't think delegates the right word really because my crews are always very small and I work with you know it, it, so I, I I like to be I, I mean look I feel I'm responsible for every area of a shoot if I'm commissioned to do a job so I I, I wouldn't necessarily delegate as such but on a shoot like that it's one of those things that I, I, what I do like to do is everybody knows their job so I have my first assistant who runs my digi table and I have my lighting tech and we usually have a, a production assistant who kind of runs between us, which on these kind of shoots are imperative because, you know, we were, we, I was, I was asked to, to produce three setups in 15 minutes. So, you know, it, we, so, so really it's just making sure it's not delegating. It's making sure that people are comfortable and, and, and understanding their job and, and owning their job, you know? So I'm responsible for all of it. And, and I feel that I would, you know, that I, I like to collaborate with people. I don't, I, I, I think people 
learn by working with me because I allow them to be responsible for what they're doing and, and I don't like to to over I like to let people make mistakes and they learn from mistakes which is exactly which is what I did in my career so yeah I think it's delegate is um it, it, you know I don't like to delegate what I like to do is just make people responsible for their jobs yeah that makes sense and it's actually it a very sense, yeah. it does it makes complete sense and it's actually a really lovely way of of thinking about it as well because as you say you're then entrusting somebody with their own job rather than delegating elements of your job exactly yeah you mentioned mistakes then as well which is something that i was going to come on to a bit later but we might as well talk about it while we're here what are some of the best oh. mistakes you've made throughout your career that have made you mm -hmm. more efficient at your job wow <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm a big believer that learning by your mistakes makes you much stronger. And I've always liked to push myself to a point that, not carelessly, but be able to, I think, spy. Mm, that's a hard question, that. I, could, I don't know, because I've made so many mistakes in my life that I think that uh, I, I couldn't pinpoint one mistake. I think, you know, there's there's certain things that you learn by doing things a certain way and understanding that, you know, where little things like, you know, making edits at the end of the shoot and allowing too many, too many images to go through that process inevitably becomes a, a, a tiresome process at the end because people aren't looking through your eyes. They're kind of looking at, they're, they're able to... How, to, how can I articulate this in a, in the right way? There's no right or wrong, and I think making mistakes are priceless to learn from if you learn from your mistakes. If you're one of those people that just gives up after making a mistake because you've been criticised or you've been, you know, you don't like the feeling, then obviously that's not for you. But I think within our world, is that, you know, if you make a mistake and it can make you stronger, it, it's it's imperative to to push yourself to those points that you do make those mistakes and you're able to learn from it to make you to give you a kind of better viewpoint on the next job or the next situation that is in that you know that is like that so i couldn't pinpoint a mistake that's actually allowed me to 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 get better because there's so many of them and i think you you know you can learn from you can learn from everything and a mis and for me making mistakes has been probably the most the best thing i could do um because i know that i'm pushing myself there's a million and one questions i could ask you about the answer you've just given me do you ever feel i'm thinking of i mean the queen and, and the royals is the first thing that came to mind but obviously you've worked on some very very large shoots as well do you ever feel pressure on larger scale shoots and if so what techniques have you developed to use that to your advantage i do yeah i think um i don't necessarily get nervous and i but 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 i definitely feel pressure for sure how do i deal with it was that the question sorry yeah because i think it's one of those things particularly the larger the shoot you know you've got more people there's deadlines there's sometimes it feels like there's a million and one people that you have to try and please and yeah so i guess my question was twofold do you feel that pressure and if so how do you use that pressure positively rather than it affecting your work in a negative fashion yeah i think I, look i think pressure is is something that is good i think i feed off pressure i think when things are quite easy i tend to be quite lazy in those situations so Pressure always pushes me a little bit outside my comfort zone and 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 I thrive off it a little bit. And I think I, I've always had that in me that I like to challenge myself. So I think pressure, I do feel pressure for sure. And I make sure the one thing that I do going into every, I, I, I'm really, I've got OCD really badly. Everything has to be lined up. And so going into shoots, I have to prep a lot. So down to 
down to making sure that everything I, I, in my brain, not on piece of paper and not reading stuff, making sure in my head everything's kind of almost, you know, I've read the script and I kind of get it inside and, it may, and it's able to, and, and doing that. So preparation for me is the biggest thing that helps me in that um, thrive in that pressured world. Because what that allows, like OCD, like lining things up and making sure, right, okay, that's that, that's that, that's that, I understand that, means that when I'm on set and in those pressurised moments, that I can be quite organic and I can be quite, quite kind of, I I, I can push myself outside because I know where I'm at. I can push myself outside of that to come back into that comfort zone. Does that make sense? Yeah, Um, it makes total sense. And actually, I am very similar to you in terms of that OCD preparing for stuff. Do you think think where it comes to? Sorry, go on. No, 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 go on. What it comes down to is that, you know, when I was a kid, I had really bad learning difficulties. And I, it's a weird, it's a weird story. But when I was six, I drank kerosene. But it was in we we were living in Dubai at the time. My dad worked at worked at Steelworks, but we had Evian bottles full of kerosene. And I was a kid. I was I, yeah, and I was I was five. So I drank the equivalent three. Anyway, I died. I died. My heart, liver, lung, kidney failure three times. Blah 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 blah. I was in hospital for ages, and I've got really bad. I came out of there, and I got really bad amnesia but i've also got really bad dyslexia but i also struggle to really learn things and i've always been and they always blamed it onto that situation that that i was ill as a kid but i don't believe i thought i think it's just the way that i am so i have to go into situations like i have to know where everything is and even though i can be quite scatty and quite random i know that my my all my spaces are always really tidy because i need to know that's that that's that that's that and it's exactly the same going into a job i need to make sure that i've ticked the boxes and i understand it and i understand it not by just reading an email or reading a document that says we're going to do this 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 it has to physically be inside my head for me to go into a situation like that that i can cope with the pressure but also thrive off that pressure and 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 work in a way that i can take myself outside of the norm to go back into it Mm. that makes complete sense and i think it because i i work in a very very similar way to you and i think it will resonate with a lot of people because and i'm speaking from my experiences here to see if you're the same if i've know the sh- the job and what is required and I can see it and visualize it in my head it then gives me the freedom to be able to expand beyond and think of creative yeah. ideas because you know in your head you've got the basic elements and the core elements that are required you've got them nailed yeah. is that the same yeah. for you yeah totally totally yeah it's like you know you can I can set up a, a vision for a shoot and a, and it and and set up a storyboard that I know that will nail the shoe and I know that we get something amazing. But because I know I've got that, it means I can go round. I could shoot some, you know, I could shoot yes. something totally different to to make sense in that in that particular storyboard as well. And something that you can only get when you're in that environment. I, I mean, I'm a big believer as well that especially with the way that I like to work, which is which is. Yeah. Okay. Like I said, everything for me is quite well prepped, and and I understand it. But then allowing t- stuff to happen on set, allowing, I I always kind of use the term that I like to capture an image rather than force it. And I think that element of being able to have that freedom on set because you understand what you're doing on that day so well gives you that freedom to to capture and move and change it to bring it back to what you know it should be yes it makes complete it it does it makes total (laughs) sense and i'm sure it will resonate with a lot of people you also mentioned then that you you like to push yourself and again you mentioned earlier about continuously learning are you someone that will say yes and then figure it out later yeah (laughs) yeah I, I yeah I am I think also you know I've always you know like I said before is that I'm I'm still I'm still working out where I'm I am I'm in on all this you know I'm I I'm not I, I'm well off where you know not that 
not where I want to be, but I know I'm just, I'm still learning. I, you know, in my, I'm still working my voice. I'm still constantly inspired. I'm still wanting to, to kind of, my, my basic viewpoint, my, my, my kind of photography is, is very basic. You know, it's simple lights and 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 freedom to just take pictures in those environments i mean i and so i think sorry i've, I've gone off on a tangent what was the question sorry Matt. no you haven't at all i was in fact i was actually leaning forward to the microphone listening to you the question God, was <laughs> sorry i think i've forgotten what the question was oh yeah i said uh, will you say yes <laughs> i was so busy listening to you <laughs> I said, will you, um, you, you know, you like to push yourself and, and always improving. Will you say yes to something, even if you, you're not entirely sure oh, yeah. how to do it and then figure yes. it out? Yes, sorry. I, I do. I definitely say yes and then work out how to do it for sure. Because also I believe that I might, may never get asked again, you know, and, and you know, I, I, I know that, you know, I'm, I'm at a good place, but... I, I've got a long way to go, and I think, I you know, a friend of mine, really old friend of mine, used to work with. He's a screenwriter, and and he 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 worked with with this incredible guy who used to doctor scripts. And I always remember we were sat at dinner one night, and he and we we were kids. Then excuse me, we were like twenty seven, twenty eight, and he we were chatting about work just work in general in the great world and and you know kind of where we want to be in 10 years time or five years time and i was like yeah i'm gonna be a big photographer blah, blah, blah. but he, he just always said to me to me uh, at this table to me and my best mate nick he just said never stop learning how to learn as soon as you stop learning how to learn you're fucked and i was like and and it always just stuck into my head that yeah actually i i I like to approach everything as something totally new that I've never done before, even if it's similar or if it's something that I've been in the same environment before. I'd always approach it in a way that, all right, what can I do better? How can I do this in a way that I'm, I kind of feel like I'm growing and I'm, and I'm learning and I'm understanding things in a different way. And, and, and again, just keep challenging myself because I absolutely love what I do, you know, and I think, I think there's certain people that get to a certain level that that they get bored or they go, oh, well, I'm, you know, I want to retire in a few years, or you know, what's going to happen with the wife? And I'm like, I, I, I love it so much that I just want to every. I, I'd always, you know, and it's I'm my own biggest enemy because <laughs> I'm a, I, I literally I, I've got to learn how to say no sometimes because I just say yep, 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 and if I've got time, yep. And then I'll work out how to do it and how I'll bring bring what I do to the table, but also just expanding my voice and kind of, and and working out, you know, where my voice is and and what I'm trying to say with all of this because I'm not sure yet. It's so refreshing to hear you say that <laughs> because you do, you know, you look at your work and yeah, I did before our conversation. I thought, you know, this guy he's got it all figured out, and it's so nice to hear you say that you haven't and you're still learning and i think it's one of the beautiful yeah. things about not just photography but just about life and just creating stuff in general is that it's not maths there's no x plus y equals z yeah and it's so nice to hear you say that you also mentioned earlier you touched on processes which is something i wanted to look up with you because i think sometimes people underestimate the processes after you've taken the image and you said about not putting too many through because you can lose sight of actually what you're looking for yeah from the moment you've finished a shoot and you've taken the card out of the camera to delivering yeah. what will be your final image or images what does your process yeah. look like sorry say that again sorry because I, I was thinking i was actually thinking before you go into that question i was just thinking about something then because actually it just made sense to me about probably why i've done things the way i've done things because again i never went to college and i never went to university so when you're working for photographers and you're working for for big photographers that you are in a pressure i don't think they give you know obviously you learn that you learn a craft and you're learning every day but i think the the kind of real personal side to 
for me photography is is what picture you what picture do i choose you know out of out of a commission shoot that's that that's got you know other people's voices attached to it and that other people's got an opinion on it so i i think when when you're somebody like me that's not learned i think probably at college i don't know i mean maybe somebody else can tell me this but at college they teach you how to edit maybe or how to make a final decision within your thousands of pictures that you've got so i and, and there's some of the mistakes i've made where you know where when i've gone into commission shoots that i've kind of given away some sometimes too many images so people have got a pool of i don't know 50 images where i've got my favorite but they might choose something different and then you think oh do they not like the picture i like then and 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 you kind of start to realize that or you start to learn that actually you you've got you've got to really if you're if you're being asked to take a picture for something they're, they're not just getting you to turn up on the day and take a picture they're asking you to deliver a, a, a set of images or an image that are are you and your voice and and what you do and stand for as well as obviously the the, the talent that's within that so yeah you know the, the 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 process after my shoots now by mistake go from you know the, the the whole the whole body of of the shoe or or the whole session of the shoe and i over the course of a few days i will go from say 200 images down to 50 images then 50 images down to 20 images then 20 images down to 10 images and i'll always walk away from it and then come back to it I, I, I'm not, you know, my, my, my working mentality on set is very quick and I like to move quickly. I don't like to hang on things too long because I think you lose moments there. So, but, but the, the, the post or the back end part of what I do as a photographer for me is really time consuming. I spend a lot of time looking at images and going, yeah, I like that and walking away from it, coming back. No, I don't like it now. I like this. And it just takes me a, f a few days and a few, you know, the, the process is quite, a time consuming i spend a lot of time doing it but b it's um you know it's it, it mentally it's quite uh draining for me because I, I chop and change so it's 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 a really kind of there's no for that the formula is to spend as much time go walk going looking at it and walking away looking at it walking away looking at it walking away to get to a point within my deadline that i go right that's what i like and then and and, and that's how i do it it's quite chaotic, really. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is. My head's like I'm mad just thinking about it. But yeah. What, what does that time away, that reflection time, offer you? To not think about it, because I think about things a lot. So I'll try and actually do something different, whether it's working on um, some images for something different or, or literally get, oh, I've got a, a spinner. I actually bought a piano over lockdown, go and play the piano and just... And, and so my mind actually is not sat in a room watching TV thinking about the picture. I'm actually really thinking about what I'm doing. And it really takes me away from from what I've just done to come back again with a completely fresh canvas with, you know, with a, I suppose, again, it's that thing maybe my, my brain just has that time to process, to process things, to go, yeah, I know all of that now. Right, okay, that's where I'm going. That's where I want to take this. Yes. And it makes total sense. Again, I, I do some, Yeah, it does. I mean, I do something very similar, but I, I, I would adore to play the piano. Sadly, I can't, or certainly not to the level I would like, but I would go for a run because yeah. it's just that, that clarity just to walk away and do something, as you say, completely different Yeah, that allows you to look at something in a completely different light. Totally, totally. I also think that... You know, actually, in lockdown, it was quite, um, you know, it's a strange time. I think strange time for everyone. But and I'm in a fortunate position, you know, I was able to come that I've got just, you know, good time. And I bought this house just before lockdown. So and I'm literally a 30 second walk from the beach. So I, I've spent a lot of time. I actually went out. I've been out. I've spent a few these last few months, although I have had a few commissions on. So I've been taking pictures, not even taking pictures, walking. And I mean, I'm I am back shooting some flowers at the moment here. And I've, I've been I've been doing something totally different to try and 
just have a bit of a break and actually it's got me way more inspired and back to a, a different set of eyes feels like i'm getting on things again now if that makes sense yeah sorry I, I'm, ra- I'm rambling what i'm saying is that like you do when when i, I i've got a spinner bike but also exercise so i'll go and walk on the beach or i ride this bike and th- through those times as well they're really good to think about other things and they really refresh you to go back into um you know work i suppose yes they do they do right we are a minute from three so i'm going to ask you one more question and then we're going to let you enjoy the rest of your afternoon if you could journey back and go and speak with that young man that was working doing all our jobs and assisting here and there spend a day with him and give him some advice what would firstly how would you spend that day and what would you say to him (laughs) oh god We'd have a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I think, you know, one of the things is just, you know, make sure that you you, you don't cut yourself short. You know, you, you try and experience everything and not be scared of it and not be scared of, of failing, you know, because I think... I think probably the biggest, like, you you know, it was a really good question about the mistakes. The mistakes for me, and I've made a lot of them, not that I regret at all because I've learned from all of them, is to not be afraid to make mistakes and, and, and grow and, and learn from those mistakes. And, and you know, I, I've been, I, I think that's, that's what I would say, is just, just don't be afraid. I think that is the perfect way to conclude our conversation. Matt Holyoke, thank you ever so much for coming on the Stand Up Photography Show. Thanks very much. That was my conversation with the wonderful, delightful gentleman that is Matt Holyoke. As with all of my guests, I am honoured and extremely grateful to Matt for taking up his time to come on the show. And it's thanks to your kind words that I was able to get him to come and speak with us. Your reviews make a huge difference in securing the finest working photographers in the world like Matt. So please, please keep them coming. It takes less than 30 seconds, but it does make a huge difference difference and don't forget if you have a question for one of our photographers you can call us on 0207 459 4295 that is 0207 459 4295 leave a message and we'll feature your question on an upcoming show for now thank you as always for joining me i've been matthew walker he has been matt holyoke and you have been sensational until next time Take care.